My name is Jim Krupnik. I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at LBL. And I, I wanted to first recognize a few uh, distinguished uh, uh, visitors here. Start with Andre Richards, who's the uh, DOE Berkeley Site Office Manager, and uh, Buck Kuntz, who's here from the University of California Office of the President, and Gordon Wozniak, who's a city councilman in the city of Berkeley. So again, I wanted to welcome you all uh, to this, uh, basically saying goodbye to the Bevatron. I know a lot of you worked here. I did myself. I started here as an EM in 1976 and worked here for four years in the EM shop under Harvey Oakley. And then I spent seven years as a coordinator. And it really was an important time in my life. I know I, I got married and I bought a house and I had two kids. And now that I think about it, it didn't really happen in that order. But uh, it was an important time in my life and I really learned about working on a team. And that was really what it was like in the EM shop and at the Bevatron, a bunch of people from different disciplines sort of working together to uh, keep this facility running. So it was an uh, important time for me and I know for a lot of you. So before I move on, I wanted to recognize uh, Cedric Larson. So Cedric was someone who really got this event going by a request. He'd heard that we were going to be taking down the Bevatron and he wanted to come see it one last time. And we got to thinking there's probably a lot of other people who want to do that. So we got this event going and unfortunately Cedric passed away recently. So I just want to recognize the fact that he started as a student in the summer of 1946-1947. He started working here in 48 and retired in 73. So he had a long career here um, working on the machine. I just want to uh, recognize him for that and for his uh, idea to sort of get this going. So uh, now I'd like to introduce the uh, interim director of the laboratory, Paul Alvisados. Well, thank you, Jim, and, and good afternoon. I'm sorry it's not a little bit sunnier out, but it's a wonderful occasion here to have a chance to commemorate this uh, little beeping going on here. Uh, it, it's amazing to have the opportunity to commemorate this uh, amazing facility that did so much great science. I'm not going to speak to that because it was something that, let's make sure my phone isn't doing it. Uh, because you know, I don't have any other gizmos, so. although usually I do, I have gizmos everywhere. But. The volume's too high. Yeah. Is this guy on? Oh, that one's just feeding over to the uh, camera there. I know it was working there a minute ago. Try it again. So. Okay, I'll try that again. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, That's it's a lot. Good job. All right. Well, so I'd like to just take a few minutes to talk to you about some of the things that are going on today at the laboratory before we go into the commemoration of uh, what transpired here in this site. Uh, Lawrence's vision of uh, multidisciplinary teams, very open in their uh, interactions, very generous in their interactions as scientists, uh, and trying to work together to solve really important problems that's a very broad vision. And early on uh, in this laboratory, laboratory's history, people understood that that, uh, that idea had implications in addition to areas of high energy physics and many other areas of science. And, and Andy Sessler will be speaking uh, in a little bit. And I think he did as much as anybody here at the laboratory to open up that concept of team science to other areas. And today at the laboratory, uh, we're experiencing a truly remarkable moment in which the lab is being asked to play a critical role in areas of energy and environment research. We have new programs that are starting up in areas like, uh, well, some existing programs that have been going on all the way since Andy's time here in areas like building efficiency, 
but growing programs in, in areas like uh, combustion, uh, research in carbon capture and sequestration, a lot of new work in biofuels, in solar photovoltaics, in artificial photosynthesis, energy storage and batteries. So across a huge range of energy technologies, we have a whole group of new programs that are opening up. In fact, uh, the laboratory today, uh, our, our, our budget this year is going to be about $660 million, which represents more than 20% growth compared to just three years ago. And uh, at the same time, that doesn't include the stimulus funding, which has been coming in, which is about $224 million so far. So the, the, the lab is just growing enormously. And in fact, uh, some of our deepest concerns involve how to handle growth in a short period of time like that and to be prepared for the possibility that uh, it may not continue forever. But nonetheless, we, we are at a moment where we have an extraordinary opportunity as a laboratory to have an, an impact on global problems of, of, uh, of the environment. And um, I think many of my colleagues here have become convinced that, uh, that this lab can make a huge difference and that working together, we can in fact find ways in which we can help to find solutions to the, to the problem of global CO2, uh, greenhouse gases, global warming, and at the same time to help build an environment in which we have new, uh, new industries and new technologies developing here in the United States to create uh, green jobs and to create uh, a very exciting uh, new future for our nation. So it's an exciting time here at the lab in that respect. Now, the site that we're in, I just mentioned to you, the lab is growing enormously. And as you can probably imagine, uh, not a day goes by when we're not having a lot of discussion about where's everything gonna go? And uh, in fact, we're having trouble fitting everything on site. You might know, for example, almost 25% of the lab is in fact off site today. Uh, we have activities like the Joint Genome Institute that's in Walnut Creek, the Joint Bioenergy Institute in Emeryville, our supercomputer system is in Oakland, our life science division is in West Berkeley and Potter Street. So almost 25% of the lab is in fact off-site. And that means of course that anything that's on-site, uh, we have to look at very, very carefully to see uh, how it's gonna be used in the future. This particular site, the, the site here of the Bevatron, uh, we do have our eyes on it for a future project that will be very critical uh, for the future of the laboratory. I don't know for sure uh, that this will be the site that is uh, the selected one, but our laboratory has been involved uh, in an exercise jointly with our colleagues um, at Stanford, at SLAC, for some time now, looking at the possibility of creating uh, a new light source that would be a soft X-ray free electron laser, which uh, for the moment as a placeholder is being called NGLS for next generation light source, but hopefully somebody will come up with a much better name uh, in, the, in the future. Meanwhile, we're planning for that, uh, and this site, this particular site, would be one that would enable such a facility to be uh, constructed, we think. So it's, an, it's one of the sites that we're looking at uh, most carefully, and uh, that a uh, soft X-ray free electron laser would have its output uh, the, close to here, and then the site that we're on here, there would be a series of um, uh, stations uh, that, would, uh, that the free electron laser would be able to kind of like a Gatling gun uh, raster across and uh, send uh, X-rays. Now this X-ray source, which would operate in the soft X-ray regime, would have many characteristics. It would be a laser, have high coherence, could be used for special kinds of imaging, but uh, most exciting for us in many ways would be the time duration of the X-ray pulse, which would be in the neighborhood of 100 attoseconds. And uh, I'd like to remind you that time of 100 attoseconds is comparable to the um, Bohr orbit time for an electron in an atom, so that uh, the hope is that these new sources will enable the um, ability to examine the motions of electrons uh, inside uh, atoms and molecules to look at the dynamics of those motions. So there's a bright future for this site, um, even as we commemorate the great and amazing history that has gone on here before. Uh, let me just now turn to um, the next uh, topic.
I'd like to uh, uh, acknowledge um, Andy Sessler. Uh, and uh, Andy, as you all know, of course, was the director of this laboratory from 1973 to 1980. That's seven years, and that's, <laughs> that's a, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, that I'm sure it was uh, an exciting time, and also one in which many, many changes took place here at the laboratory. Andy has continued, of course, as you know, afterwards to be engaged in many other uh, aspects of uh, activities with the American Physical Society, with looking at landmine use, uh, and also continued interest in accelerator design. Just a month or so ago, uh, I had a group of people coming to my office to talk to me about uh, proposals for a new uh, uh, carbon uh, uh, nucleus accelerator that could be used for uh, cancer therapy. And among the group of scientists who came there uh, was Andy, who was one of the most, uh, the foremost uh, uh, advocates for that particular project. So he remains engaged uh, today uh, very much in his in his research, and that's a model for all of us. And uh, Andy, it would be good to hear from you about the Bevatron. I'm told to wait. <laughs> Well, as you well know, all farewells are painful. Just look around in an airport or in a train station, and final farewells are particularly painful. Think of the loss of a loved member of a family or a funeral of a dear friend. Today, we are gathered to say a final farewell to the Bevatron. And those of us who remember and were associated with it, it is, for most of us, a rather poignant experience. For many years, the Bevatron and later the Bevelac were the centers of the laboratory. Uh, and although the honor was passed on, <laughs> stay there, <laughs> uh, passed on in February of 1993, as long as a Bevatron was here, it caused memories. For me, every day as I drove by, somehow the Bevatron remained the center of the lab, at least in spirit, if not in reality. The Bevatron dominated science for almost 40 years. Of course, different areas of science at different times. An incredibly long time for a scientific instrument, and a tribute to the accelerator scientists who ever improved, modified, and significantly enhanced its capabilities. And of course, also a tribute to the many fine scientists who designed wonderful experiments to be done here. It is the genius and capability of members of these two groups to which we can ascribe the long and ever so fruitful life of the Bevatron. Let me briefly, in this talk, review those wonderful years. The first beam was brought in in January of 1954 by Ed Lofgren and his people. Besides Lawrence, I can think of Lloyd Smith and Louis Alvarez, Bill Brobeck, Dwayne Shell, Ed McMillan, and many others. The first planning was in 1948, and construction uh, cost a mere $9 million. That was started in 1951. Construction was delayed about a year, and therefore the Cosmotron at Brookhaven beat out the Bevatron, actually. Uh, that, was, that delay was due to the fact that people were pulled off to work on the materials testing accelerator, the MTA. Well, maybe the less said about the MTA, the better. <laughs> Let me now turn to the science that was done at the Bevatron and later the Bevelac. And in this regard, I was helped by my friends, Herb Steiner, Art Postkanza, Bill Chu. So first I think of high energy physics. The Bevatron was built to discover the antiproton. Uh, the first runs were in August of 1955, and they were interrupted by a 
breakdown from August 29th to September 5th. But then the first observations of the antiproton were made on September 21st by Nobelists Segre and Chamberlain with significant contributions from Clyde Wiegand and Tom Ypsilantis. None of these people are with us anymore. At almost the same time, there were lead glass Cherenkov observation by the Lofgren Moya group, including Bruce Kalk and Bill Wenzel, and emulsion observations by the Segre Chamberlain group, including Gerson Goldhop and Warren Chop, and a whole crew in Rome under Eduardo Amaldi. And also, there were annihilation studies by the Barker Slavkin group, including, amongst others, Bob Burge, Warren Chop, Schuler, and Gerson Goldhopper, Harry Heckman, Gustav Epsong, and Jack Sandweiss. They were followed by observations of anti neutrons, not just anti protons, by Cork, Wenzel, Glenn Lambertson, and Oresti Piccioni. They were all great scientists living in exciting times and doing their thing, and doing it very well. Great scientists. A magician, I think, would conjure with these names. They're magical. High energy physics continued at the Bevatron for many years. Many of those mentioned continued to be involved, but also many others, such as the George Trilling Gold Harbor Group and from the Lofgren Group, which included some already mentioned, plus Dennis Keefe and Walt Hartzell, Jack Peterson, Leroy Kurth, Tommy Ilyoff. And there's also the propane bubble chamber work of the Powell Burge Group, the polarized target work by Chamberlain and Herb Steiner Group, studies of rare decay modes by the Lofgren Group, pion nuclear scattering studies by Moyer Helmholtz Group and Segre Chamberlain Groups, and many other studies far too many for me to even mention. In addition, there was an increasing number of scientists from other institutions and even from other countries. I think of Oreste Piccioni, Shoji Nakamiya, and many others. And finally, we should remember the many students, many of whom went on to illustrious careers at other institutions. As many of us have come to expect, it was for a completely unexpected reason that the Bevatron made a major contribution to the science of high energy physics. I refer, of course, to the discovery of many resonances, i.e. strange new particles. And this study was led by Louis Alvarez using a 72 inch and later the 80 inch bubble chamber built upon Don Glazer's ideas with a construction led by Paul Hernandez and Don Gao and many others. It resulted in the Nobel Prize in 1972. And I think of members of Group A, with Lynn Stevenson, Lena Galtieri, Bob Tripp, Frank Solmet, uh, Art Rosenfeld, Moish Pripstein, Philip Eberhard, and some wonderful graduate students like Stan Flatte. Let me now turn to the Bevelac. Al Grosso and Bob Main had built the Hylac, which by the 70s had become the Super Hylac. And Al Gyoso had the great idea to connect it to the Bevatron. The connection of the two machines was made by Hermann Grunder and many others and completed on August 1974. This allowed the Bevatron to accelerate all the ions in the periodic table to relativistic energies that is to become the Bevelac. The op this opened up really two exciting fields of science. One was relativistic nuclear physics, and the other was ion beam biology and medicine. First, let me talk about nuclear science. In nuclear science, there were a number of important accomplishments. I think people can't hear in the back, correct? Right. Yeah. So we're going to switch out a mic. I hope you don't mind. We're just going to take a second to Can get the sound over? better. Do I start over? No. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let them decide. Huh? Sorry. About that. Yeah. There. Yeah. I got to put this down. This thing out of here. Okay. 
Okay. Does that work? It In nuclear science, there were a number of important accomplishments. All right, good. But the most important was establishing the field of relativistic nuclear collisions. This work was carried on later at CERN and resulted, of course, in the RIC facility at Brookhaven, the FAIR facility in Germany, and even plans for the LHC at CERN in Switzerland. We all remember the plastic ball, which was the first electronic 4 pi detector in nuclear physics, conceived and built by Hans Gottbrand, Art Postkanzer, and Hans George Ritter, and more than 20 others, actually. And we remember the excitement of the discovery of the collective flow of nuclear matter by Ritter, Postkanzer, and those working with them. The Heckman group. Doug Greiner and Harry Heckman made extensive studies of particle fragmentation, and James Simons and Iso Tanihara and Gary Westfall used this phenomena to discover new isotopes. And the target could also be fragmented, and Postkanzer and Earl Hyde used this to discover different isotopes. In short, the nuclear scientists made the Bevelac most particularly was post-cancer and Jean Gosserat established the field of nuclear collisions, relativistic nuclear collisions. Let me turn to biology and medicine. The biologists and therapists established the field of space radiation biology and external beam, ion beam therapy used for cancer. I think of Cornelius Tobias, Max Boone, Ellie Blakely, Joe Castro, Jacob Fabrikan, Tom Budinger, uh, Loki, uh, I'm sorry, Chattachaji, Bill Chu, Mark Nyman, and there are many others also. The first space radiation biology was actually predicted by Cornelius Tobias in 1952, and he predicted that the astronauts would see flashes of light due to ions passing through their eyes. And this was actually uh, established at, at the Bevatron before the Bevelac in 1971. And this work then led space science, space ion science, to work at the 88 inch and a rather extensive NASA facility at Brookhaven. However, I think it was the establishing of ion beam external ion beam therapy that was a major impact of this group. Working with many different ions and studying their effect on cells, small animals, and then on humans took many years and a great deal of effort. Very heavy ions were discarded because of fragmentation, but it was established that ions in the range up to about carbon produced, compared even to protons, to say nothing of comparison with x-rays, uh, ad advantages in, as in treatment of cancer. All right. This group made a number of other discoveries along the line. They discovered scanning of ion beams for patient treatment. And in addition, the use of radioactive beams, which would be an image of the stopping region of the beam of ions in the patient's body. And this has the potential of the use of treatment verification and real-time imaging, something that is not done clinically yet, but potentially will be. And finally, it was established in many situations that shorter treatment courses were possible. In order to actually treat patients, two beam lines were developed for that purpose. And they had to be designed to function perfectly every time. And most importantly, no matter what malfunctions occurred, the patients were not to be given an excess dose of radiation. In some, 1,314 patients were treated in the Bevelac. Many lives were saved and much suffering eliminated. 
But really what they accomplished was they established ion beam therapy. As a result, facilities have been built around the world. At the last count, there were five in Japan, many in Europe, but none in the United States, including even the Bay Area, where it all started. Well, I can only say that we're trying to change that situation. All right, I don't have time to go more deeply into the science of Bevatron, Bevelac. Let me just conclude by making some remarks. We have not come here today to honor and remember a machine. A machine, after all, is steel and concrete. We are here today to honor and remember the science that was done with that machine. Although even that will fade away. We're really here to honor and remember the people involved. The accelerator, scientists, engineers, and technicians who designed, built, kept in operation, and significantly improved the machine. And the scientists who used the machine in so many clever experiments. I have mentioned some of these people, but there are many more. Some of these individuals are still here, but many, too many, are no longer with us. It's memory of these people, those getting on in years and those who have passed beyond that makes this day so poignant. Yet we remember those great times filled with wondrous accomplishments and discoveries. Those of us who lived through that special period were most fortunate, and we will be forever thankful for that opportunity. And we will forever remember those great times. Thank you. Well, thank you, Andy. It was great to hear um, your reminiscences and to hear about the uh, great science that took place here, besides just the discovery of the, or the observation of the antiphoton, so many other great things that happened uh, at, at this location. It's really very inspiring. Um, I have now the opportunity to honor a scientist who um, played a critical role in the history that you've just heard about, and that's Ed Lofgren. So let me uh, remind you of some of the uh, uh, history uh, involved with Ed and the Berkeley Lab. He graduated from UC Berkeley with a bachelor's degree in 1938. He had a summer job working at the 37-inch cyclotron at the original Rad Lab. Uh, in the fall of 1940, he started graduate work, was ultimately diverted to Los Alamos uh, during the Manhattan Project, where he uh, participated and developed a method for uh, uranium isotope separation. After the war, he completed his doctorate. He returned to Berkeley in the summer of 1948 at the invitation of E.O. Lawrence, and very soon he became involved in the design and construction of a proton synchrotron that eventually could reach 6.5 billion electron volts, hence the Bevatron. And um, on April 1st, 1954, the Bevatron was declared complete, and Ed Lofgren was named the Bevatron's Chief of Operations, a position he retained until 1979. And I think you heard uh, throughout Andy Sessler's description that uh, while he was engaged in that role, he was continuously engaged in many uh, scientific discoveries, leading a research group that used this facility to do great science. Um, in 1993, uh, Ed Bofgren, who was involved, obviously, at the very uh, earliest stages of the Bevatron, uh, also was the person who uh, turned the Bevatron off last time it was turned off, <laughs> and thus ended the four decades of research that was done here at the laboratory. Uh, it took uh, 16 years since then for us to actually uh, get the funding to um, demolish this site so that we could prepare it for future work. Uh, 
but here we are today with that support so that we can use this site for future work but i think it's just wonderful to have this opportunity to honor a scientist who's had such a huge impact here at the laboratory and who was present throughout that incredible period so ed we have a plaque here which we'd like to acknowledge you with if you could come and join me up here Thank you for your years of service to the Bevatron and to Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Someone had told me that this event was going to occur. I might have had a chance to think of something to say. But since I really only knew about this, conscience of this uh, affair uh, yesterday. I, I didn't have a chance to uh, prepare a speech. So, well, I have two possibilities. One, I could say nothing. The other possibility is I could see if I could think of some appropriate remarks uh, to make. Well, I'll take the latter. And if you can tolerate it. Uh, the person who should be, if you want to think of person, the person who should be thought of as the originator of the better time is Bill Brobeck. Uh, Bill was a mechanical engineer, but uh, uh, that was his title in his studies. But in fact, he was more a universal engineer. And it was he who first uh, proposed what became the better time. Uh, and in fact, there was some opposition. Uh, the, uh, uh, there were people who, 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 there were people who even thought it was a dangerous thing and, and shouldn't be part of. Uh, academic program. Uh, Bill, Bill was a very gifted and knowledgeable engineer, and he just kept plodding around, plodding along, and uh, designed uh, the first of what became a whole series of uh, I am accelerated. Uh, there were several other people who uh, contributed various aspects. Uh, of course, Lawrence would be the most prominent among these. He, he was the one who, who uh, could get the money to build something, could have uh, the proceeds to uh, go through the hierarchy of the university and so on. Uh, the next I would mention would be Ed McMillan, who was uh, certainly one of the most gifted scientists that uh, uh, the, 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 the ever was associated with uh, uh, the laboratory. 
So, Joe, are you? Come on up. So, we'll be uh, we'll be hosting some tours and have some occasions here for discussion among you. So, uh, you want to take it so when I was getting ready this morning, my wife told me I should put on my gray jacket. And I said, "Is that to go with the highlights, the gray highlights in my hair?" And, she says, no, you're going to be around many gray shield blocks at the Bevatron. And I said, well, many of these shield blocks have bright colors. Should I put bright colors in my hair? She says, no, then you'd be competing with Ben Feinberg. <laughs> so Andy, Andy spoke of the past, and Paul spoke of the future. And I'll say a few words about what we would call the current the Building 51 and Bevatron Demolition Project. I'm the project director for, the, uh, for this project, and I figured out what that means. It means that you do fairly little, but you get an inordinate amount of the credit. And what I'd like to do is to spread that credit around to uh, the, the uh, project team, uh, many of the members that we have here today. Uh, first is Barry Savnick, who is the federal project director uh, is providing guidance and uh, assurance of the, the, the funding for the project. And then the project manager, they're, they're, they're kind of scattered around in very inconspicuous places because they don't want to take uh, any of the credit. But Bob Cronin is the project manager. Aaron Beardsley is the project administrator. Dan Root is the radiation control technician. And Rocky Ekafee uh, uh, is the safety engineer. And while my team does work very hard, sometimes they get to take a vacation. John Patterson is on a vacation in Europe right now. And many of you know Bob Miller, who uh, we brought in as the technical expert. He's come back to uh, help educate uh, the, uh, us as well as the contractor in how to um, pull the, demo, uh, the Bevatron apart. But personally, I think he's having too much fun to be calling it work. We have Klaus Construction, who is, the, uh, is providing the, the demolition here, and there are uh, a host of folks. A few of them are here today. Kevin Smallwood is the radiation manager. They're hiding over there. Uh, Kevin Murphy is the rad lead. Tony Baca is the superintendent of the project. Juan Valencia is the labor lead, and uh, Ramundo Gamba is also the labor lead. So Jim talked uh, about the team approach. I was going to talk a little bit about that, um, but I'll just emphasize that we do have a team. It takes a lot of, uh, a lot of people to uh, handle a project like that, and I'm, uh, this is a $50 million demolition project, and I'm embarrassed when Andy says that it took $9 million to build. How could it take so much to demolish it? So uh, the project, uh, in 2004, we received a little bit of money uh, for demolition and we're able to dem uh, demolish the EPB hall, which was the high bay out here where many of the medical science experiments were done and where you uh, where you likely parked today. But in 2006, uh, uh, DOE got serious with the funding and, uh, and committed funding for the entire project. That led to formation of a project team, preparation of the environmental documents, one of which is a Historic American Building Survey that is now published in the Library of Congress commemorating the architecture of this uh, facility. We collected a number of artifacts and that we hope that when the new facility is put on the site that we will have a display commemorating uh, the science and engineering feats that were performed here. We prepared the bid documents and then in July 2008 the DOE approved for us to proceed with the, the demolition. It took us a year to uh, isolate all of the utilities from this building and to remove the 
uh, hazardous uh, materials from inside the building, and then we were ready to start on shield block removal in uh, last July. We're actively um, pursuing uh, that endeavor, and as you'll see uh, when you take the tour a little bit, is that we have removed some of the exterior wall blocks right down to the floor, and so you can see the accelerator uh, as, as you walk through the facility. We'll complete shield block removal uh, next February, and then in the Bevatron, removal has already started, but it will uh, also uh, continue in parallel and complete uh, next August. So then in a very short time period, three months, from August to November uh, next fall, so a year from now, uh, we will demolish the buildings down to the foundation. Through the winter and into the spring, then we're going to remove the slabs, uh, the deep tunnels, and uh, remediate the soils. We're going to leave in place the deep foundations uh, of this facility. So <clears throat> many of you, I'm sure, will have mixed emotions as you tour the facility and see this um, wonderful machine that uh, you so lovingly put together is now being uh, dismantled, in many cases, torn apart. You took pride in uh, the Vevatron. But you should also be proud that this new science a new accelerator that Paul has talked about would not be possible uh, but for those foundations of engineering and scientific discovery that you have laid. It's, it is for these foundations, literally in a small way, the piles that we're leaving below uh, the Bevatron that will form the foundation for a new structure, but figuratively in a much larger way the education that you have provided to those engineers and scientists currently working at, the, uh, at LBNL, that we owe you, all of you, a great deal of gratitude. And I would like to give you a round of applause. So, logistics. Um, we will have, there's still a few punch and cookies left. Um, and we will have tours, there's, there'll be self-guided tours, and as uh, you can walk in either direction uh, around the Bevatron, and you might see a few of these around. Uh, this is a rad rope, this is uh, danger tape, and caution tape. And so we've, we've formed a path basically all the way around the Bevatron, so if you start in one direction, you're going to end up uh, right back here. And I'd like you to be careful about a number of uh, bumps in the road, if you will, holes in the plates uh, that, are, that uh, uh, could be tripping hazards. So please be aware as you walk through. And, uh, the, um, and as well, um, there is a little bit of lead dust here. And so uh, before you eat, take anything to eat, there are hand wipes here that I'd like you to clean your hands with just to be careful that you don't uh, ingest any lead dust. So thank you, everybody, for coming. I, um, I want to celebrate the, the Bevatron. Thank you.